are locked in a battle, not for land or territory or riches, but for people's lives and souls. And the only weapon we have for this is the written word. The Messiah has proved this to us over and over and over. And so when one goes astray, we go to war. And we use the word to do it. We also use the word as our foundation to teach and live our lives according to. The Torah of Jehovah devotes nearly two complete parshiot to the affliction known as Zaharat, which translates out and means to erupt. Study after study has reached the same conclusion. Zaharat is a result of evil speech, also known as the evil tongue, which in the Hebrew is Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara covers a variety of what should be labeled as a sin. For instance, in the book of Mishle, or Proverbs 20, verse 19, we read, He who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with him who speaks smoothly with his lips. Again, in Mishle, chapter 10, verse 18, he says, He who hides hatreds has lying lips. And he who sends out a slander is a fool. And what about what our Messiah said? He warned us that from out of the heart come forth wicked reasoning, murders, adulteries, whoring, thefts, false witnesses, slanderers. These all defile a man. It's amazing the category of sins the Messiah associates with slanders. King Shlomo wrote that there are six matters which Jehovah hates, and seven are an abomination to him. And among these seven things are a lying tongue, a false witness, breathing out lies, and one who causes strife among the brothers. All of these are examples of Lashon Hara. But truly, none of them actually begin with the tongue. All Lashon Hara begins in the heart of one rebelling against Jehovah and his Messiah, Yehoshua. They come out of our mouths, but that's where, not where they begin. Last week's Parsha was entitled Zaria, and 59 of its 67 verses were dedicated to explaining how the Kohen was to identify Zaharat on a person, his clothing, anything made of leather, and how to pronounce him to be either clean or unclean. Now, in this week's Parsha, Jehovah addresses what a person is required to do for the day of his cleansing. That's in Leviticus 14.1, and you may want to turn to Leviticus 14. Vayikra, I want you to follow along with me today in some of what we're going to be looking at. The Parsha is entitled Mazora, which is a Hebrew name given to someone who has been declared to have Zaharat. In fact, the word Zohar and Zaharat share the same root word, closely tied together. On the day of his cleansing, the Mazor is brought to the priest, but not inside the camp. The priest went out to him. And there he would see if the Zaharat had been healed or not. Now, if the Kohen declares the person is no longer a Mitzor, he was commanded to bring the appointed offerings to Yehovah and to follow specific commandments. Among those commandments were two live and clean birds, one is killed and the other is set free, he to shave all of his hair off. He then washes himself in water and is clean, but he must remain outside of his own tent for seven, another seven days. On the seventh day, he is to shave off all the hair of his head and his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair he shaves off, which teaches us that Vayikra 19.27 is about not destroying the corners of one's beard and not shaving in general. 
Here a person who has committed the sin that led to Zarot is, com is commanded to shave, and it's obvious that the father would not tell somebody to sin in order to make up for another sin. Okay. Then on the eighth day, he brings two male lambs perfectly, one ewe lamb, a year old, a perfect one, three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a mincha, and one log of oil. One lamb is slain, and the coin places some of the oil on the tip of the man's right ear, right thumb, and on his right big toe. Then he does the same with the oil, and the rest of oil is put on the man's head. That's just an overview of what happens to a person on the day of his cleansing from this Mechzor. Actually, the eight days of his cleansing. Yes, John? No, you will remember that Miriam was afflicted with Zarat as well. Okay, so, but that uses the man because, how do I word this without getting in trouble? Yes, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't know that, but we'll, we'll get into that a little later this afternoon. And some of the, the ins and outs and the details there, the priests were very familiar with and taught and trained, and some of that had been lost through the years because the priesthood had been lost. The Levites that were supposed to be doing all this and teaching all this were having to ask questions about all of this. Touche, okay? Now, in verse 21 of chapter 14, he said, but if he is a poor, if he is poor, and unable to afford these required offerings, he is given other options that he can't afford. Sounds very much like the sin offerings of Leviticus chapter 5. In those cases, if a person couldn't afford a lamb or a female goat, he could bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. And if he was so poor that he couldn't even afford the bird, he could bring one-tenth one of an ephah of fine flour as a sin offering. But in the case of a Metzora, one guilty of speaking evil of a brother, we don't find the same latitude given. Even if he is poor and unable to afford the required sacrifices, he is still required to bring one male lamb as a guilt offering and one-tenth of an F of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, and a log of oil, and two turtle doves, or two pigeons, such as he is able to afford, one shall bring a sin offering, and the other a sin offering. Bring one as a sin offering among the birds. And I studied this passage, I kept coming back to the same question. What happens if the man is so poor that he can't even afford the lesser required animal? What if he can't afford one lamb? And in verse 32, this says, This is the Torah of one who had an infection of Zaharat who is unable to afford his cleansing. So what would happen to a person if he was so poor he couldn't afford to buy this lamb or to provide this lamb that was required because it was not excused like in the offerings of Baruch chapter 4 and 5. What happened to him? Was he lost forever? What happens if he can't afford the debt to pay the debt that he do, that he was owed? Really? Good point. But that's when it struck me. Yes, Dale? Right. That's what that's what kind of what kept coming back to me. What happens when you have a debt you can't pay? In verse 24, the Torah commands the Kohen to take the lamb with the guilt offering and the log of oil, weigh them before Jehovah, and then the lamb is slaughtered and the metzor is anointed as required. And I agree with Dale. I think if the metzor couldn't afford the lamb, the Kohen 
may have supplied the lamb for him. And reading this reminded me that I once had a debt because of sin that I couldn't pay. And the Messiah provided a lamb for me. My sin was because of rebellion against the word of Jehovah, the Elohim of Israel, the very people that I yearned to be a part of. A debt I couldn't pay until the Messiah provided himself as the lamb Jehovah required. So yes, I think that the Kohen supplied the lamb for the one that couldn't afford to pay his own debt. But imagine the sin of Lashon Hara required more of a sacrifice than other sins. This should teach us how much our Father rejects, despises, hates, whatever words you want to put in there, gossip, slander, being a busybody, being involved in other people's business and spreading it all over the place. This is far more serious a sin than we give it credit for. It is a sin who has plagued our people for generations. But it is not a sin that is too powerful to be mastered. Now, Yaakov once wrote that the tongue is unruly, evil, filled with deadly poison, and no man can tame it. That's from Yaakov 3.8. And this is true. But it may be true because people try to tame the tongue without taming their heart first. If you don't have a change of heart, you will never tame your tongue. So when you humble yourself before the Father with a broken and contrite heart, then your heart will tame the tongue. This is the Sabbath before Pesach and the start of unleavened bread. Scripture is called Chag Matve. The feast, the festival, Chag of unleavened bread. You know, you get the idea if you wanted to have a feast of bread, it would be the big, these big brothers loaves of bread. But no, see, this is a feast of unleavened bread. No sin. It's a feast that recognizes what happens when we remove sin from our lives. It's also a time of cleaning the leaven out of our homes, symbolic of cleaning the sin out of our lives, and more. See, unlike leaven, sin is something we must keep out of our lives. We only have to remove the leaven for seven days. It's interesting to me that the Metzorah, once clean, had to remain outside of his tent for seven more days as well. He could only return to his tent his home on the eighth day. There, has, there is so much to learn from the symbolism in the Torah, the deep sowed levels of things throughout our Torah. You, you know what I'm familiar with, right? We have the Peshat, the plain, simple level. But then we read this and we read how, well, leaven is actually represents sin, so we're supposed to get sin out of our house. But understanding the symbolisms of Torah do not replace guarding and doing his commandments as they are written in his word. It is taught among some of the traditional teachers that Shlomo believed that since he understood the reasons for the commandments, he didn't have to worry about keeping them because he was so wise, surely he would never break any of the commandments. And so it's actually written in one place where he actually changed one letter in the Torah he was writing and because he understood. As long as he understood why the commandments were given, then he didn't worry too much about them. That's a tradition in Torah. With that in mind, let's review some of the commandments as given by Yehovah in his written Torah. 
the same commandments that were guarded and taught by his son, our Messiah. Now, I'm going to slide out of the way because we have some slides that we're going to share with you this morning. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 23, by Yikra chapter 23. It's just a few pages over from our Parsha. And the chapter includes the appointed times that were established on the fourth day of creation. Right, she's chapter 1, verse 14. And these are the appointed times of Leviticus chapter 23. The Sabbath is the first one listed. Then we have Pesach, the festival of unleavened bread. Habikarim is first fruits of the barley harvest. Then we have Shavuot, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, all right, Feast of Tabernacles. These are, if you pay close attention to verse 2, the appointed times of Jehovah. They belong to Jehovah, and he gave them to his children. This is a family affair, right? That's what he said. Speak to the children of Israel, the appointed times of Jehovah, which you are to proclaim as set apart gatherings. My appointed times are these. And I want to draw attention to the phrase set apart gatherings. Okay? Now, the word set apart is from Kadesh, and it means to make something independent. To set it apart where it's different from everything else. It's not dependent on anything else. It's separate. These appointed times, beginning with the Sabbath day. Sabbath, seventh day, okay? Are to be set apart. It is to be treated and observed differently than the other days of the year. Or the week. So if I tell you that something is set apart, what does it mean? It's different. You do things differently on the Sabbath day or the appointed time than you do on the others that aren't appointed times. The word gathering, mikra, is from that root word, kofresh and ala, and it means to summon and change direction. It teaches that we are summoned to a convocation. That's another word for gathering. And I want you to pay close attention to the definition of a convocation. It is defined as a group of people formally assembled for a special purpose, mostly ecclesiastical or academic. In the Hebrew, it says we're to gather together, a formal gathering. So from the Hebrew text of Jehovah's written word, we learn this about his appointed times. They are set apart days in which we don't treat them as regular work days. On these days, we are called to formally gather together and do what he has commanded us to do on those days. The first Pesach, for instance, was observed in the homes of the Hebrew slaves. If the household was small, they gathered together and with other families so there would be no, no meat would be left over or wasted. But now after the Exodus, Jehovah commands, not suggest that we gather together as a formal assembly to keep Pesach, which we do. But this is also true of the weekly Sabbath because it is the first of his appointed times. The Sabbath is a mikra kodesh, a set-apart gathering. We are commanded by Jehovah in the Hebrew Scriptures and I say the Hebrew Scriptures because some people translate the English a little bit different. But according to the Hebrew Scriptures, we are commanded to gather together in a formal assembly to honor the set-apart day. Those who teach that we as Israel are not required to gather together as an assembly on this day are either misinformed, misled, unfamiliar with Jehovah's Word, or they're trying to protect their own traditions or desires. The Father says these are set apart gatherings. Of course, for those that don't consider themselves part of the children of Israel, they may not believe 
that this written commandment of Jehovah applies to them. Either way, what they are not doing is walking in obedience to Jehovah's word. Nor are they following the example the Messiah himself set for us to follow. I will pause to give room for comments if you'd like to. I will even stop long enough for somebody to correct me if I'm wrong. We must also consider the written commandments regarding Pesach and unleavened bread. The first and seventh days of Chagmetza are set apart gatherings which we are to do no serve our labor. They're high holy days. They're high Sabbath. This means that we're called to have a formal assembly on these two days, something that we have overlooked in the past, but no longer. Okay? First and seventh days of unleavened bread are Sabbath. Mikvah Kadesh, and we're together together. We are to guard this day throughout our generations ever as an everlasting law, according to Shemot 12, 17, which tells us that still applies today, right? And for the seven days of unleavened bread, no leaven is to be found in our houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened, that same being shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner, a ger, one grafting in, or a native of the land. Do not eat that which is leavened in all your dwellings. You are not to eat unleavened bread. Shemot 12, 19 through 20. Now, not only are we commanded by Yehovah to remove the leaven from our house, because that's what he said. No leaven is to be found in your houses. Okay. We are also commanded to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Not enough just to get the leaven out of your house and remove everything. You've got to find some unleavened bread and eat, eat it for seven days. Leaven is from this root word, the sheen, olive, and the resh, and it means to ferment or to cause agitation. Now, it's referring to ingredients, not people. Okay. You don't have to remove people that agitate you. You have to remove ingredients that cause up to rise. Now, turn with you and look at Shemot 12, 24. It states that we are to guard this word as a law for you and your son forever. We are to see that our children follow this commandment that was given in Shemot 12, 19 through 20 to remove leaven from their home and to eat unleavened bread for seven days. So let me encourage you as well to declare it to you. Get the leaven out of your houses during the seven days of unleavened bread. It's a commandment from Jehovah. In Shemot 12, 42, we learn that Pesach, is a night of watches unto Jehovah for all the children of Israel throughout our generation. If you are a member of the house of Israel, then you are required to keep the Passover. That's not a complicated commandment, is it? Why do so many people forget it or trip over it? That was not a rhetorical question. Why do people not keep Passover? It's clear as a bell in Scripture, over and over. I'm not, I'm not quoting all the places we're told to do it. I mean, in all honesty, the Father shouldn't have to tell us but once. And how many times did he tell us about the Sabbath? Anybody ever counted them? If repetition is important, man, the Sabbath ought to be blazing everywhere we go. Billboards up and down the highways. Well, there are a couple. Look at Shemot chapter 12, 43 through 48. I'm not going to read all of these, but I want you to make a note of them and study them yourself. Shemot 12. Forty-three through 48 lists the commandments we are required as a congregation and as the people of Israel, to follow in keeping the Passover. 
And this is for the native born or for the stranger, the girl who sojourns among us. Uh, is there any loopholes in there that you can see? Shavuot chapter 13, verses 14 and 16. We're commanded, not suggested. He's not saying, you know, when you have in your Seder, this is a pretty good idea. He says we are commanded to teach our children that by the strength of the hand of Jehovah, by the strength of hand, Jehovah brought us out of Mitzurim, out of the house of bondage. It shall be a sign on your hand and its frontlet between your eyes. We're to teach this to our children. Now, what does it mean to be a sign on your hand and frontlet between your eyes? And our children are supposed to see it and hear it out of our mouth all the time. At Mount Sinai, the children of Israel declared, and I'm going to quote from Shemot chapter 24, verse 7, all that Jehovah has spoken, we shall do and obey. How many of you in here have made that declaration so you can enter into covenant with your Father in heaven? Okay? You've made that declaration. All that Jehovah has spoken, we shall do. Hear, do, and obey. Then hear the word of Jehovah Elohim as he gave it to the people and obey what he has commanded us. He promises that now, now that you've heard this word, now if you will diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me for a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. Now, if you want to be a treasured possession of Jehovah Elohim, what does he require you to do? Speak up, because you've got to witness this everywhere you go. If you want to become a treasured possession above all the other people on the face of this earth, that you've got to diligently obey his voice and guard his covenant. And obeying his voice and guarding his covenant means showing up for his feast. Not just showing up, but participating in this. It means listening to the Messiah when he says you're to guard and do even the least commandments and teach them to others. That's what it means to be in covenant with our Father. And if you're not willing to do these, or if you're not going to do these, how can you consider yourself being in covenant with him? If you're not going to get the leaven out of your house, are you truly in covenant with the Father? Oh, that's such a silly little thing. We know what it really means, right? So did King Solomon. And guess what happened to him? When I accepted this call to become a part of Israel. And it was a very humbling and joyful time. And then to become a teacher of his word. I did so with a promise to teach only what his word says. And today I have presented you his word as it's written and it has been handed down to us from generation to generation. No tradition. No reasoning as to why, just simply the word and the commandments of Jehovah. And I want to challenge you with these questions as I close this morning. Did the Messiah gather with others to honor the Passover? Come on. Did the Messiah allow leaven to remain in his dwelling place during the days of unleavened bread? Would he have gotten, made sure all the leaven was out of his house? Did the Messiah eat unleavened bread during these same seven days? Why? Why? Could he have broke a commandment if he didn't? And if he broke a commandment, it means he would have sinned. So if we choose not to eat unleavened bread or not to leaven out of our house, 
Are we breaking a commandment? Huh? If we choose not to eat unleavened bread, if we choose not to get the leavening agents out of our home, are we breaking a commandment? Did the Messiah stay home on the Sabbath and rest, or was it his custom to regularly attend the synagogue on the Sabbath? So he didn't stay home on the Sabbath and rest? Did he turn his foot from doing his own pleasure and his own words on the Sabbath day? So whose example are you following and whose teachings are you listening to? If you listen to your Father in heaven and you listen to the Messiah, you're going to do what he did. You're going to do what the Father commanded. And count it joyful. If it is any other example or teaching than that of Yehovah our Elohim and his son, Messiah Yehoshua. And you're following other teaching from other people. Can you truly say you are diligently obeying his voices? Can you truly say that you're guarding your covenant with him if you're listening to other people and they're allowing you through their teachings to do what the Father has said not to do? Or telling you you don't have to do what the Father says you are to do? Whose covenant are you listening to? Can you truly be claimed to be part of his treasured possession? It's for me to teach, not to judge. You have to judge yourself. Knowing that he who died for you will someday judge you for your decisions and how you live. Passover is a time of coming out of the world. Passover is a time of recognizing the redemption of our Father, past and future. And leaving the old world and the old bondage and ways that we learned from the time we were born to now, leaving them behind and starting out on a fresh new life, being redeemed, following the messenger of Jehovah Elohim and learning to live. Let me encourage you. Let's make Passover this year exactly that, an exodus from the old world into following our Messiah as we prepare for the new world that's coming. We encourage you to make the trip to Mount Sinai and stand there and say, Father, whatever you have said, whatever you command, I hear, I will do, and I will obey. And then diligently search out every commandment, everything the Father tells you in his word, and live it with all your heart, soul, and strength. Because the rewards that wait for those who will are beyond anything any of us can ever imagine. He asks a lot. But he has so much to give in return. And I want to correct myself. I really don't think he asked a lot. I think he asked very little of his children. Just to love him. Walk in the ways that protect us so he doesn't lose us. And we can walk in his blessings. So with that, I'm going to say Shabbat Shalom. And give you your opportunity to offer your thoughts or comments on scripture.